Hello, and welcome to the AWP Virtual Book Club. Uh, my name is Colleen Cable, and I'm the conference director at AWP. Um, and I'm so thrilled to introduce our November Book Club author, David Heska Wanbley Wyden, author of the novel, novel Winter Counts. I've got it right here. Uh, thank you so much, David, for being here with us today. Well, it's my pleasure and my honor. Um, AWP is such an important organization to me. I, I met my agent at AWP, and so it's just it's, it's great to be here. Um, just to give a little brief background on David, um, he is an enrolled citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Nation and received his MFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He was a McDowell Colony Fellow, a Tin House Scholar, and the recipient of PEN America's Writing for Justice Fellowship. Winter Counts is a New York Times book review editor's choice, Publishers Weekly Best Books of 2020, a Book of the Month main selection, Amazon editor's pick for mystery and thriller, and many other well-deserved accolades. A lawyer and professor, he lives in Denver, Colorado with his family. Um, so thank you again for being here. Um, and I wonder if you could start by reading an excerpt and giving us some um, background information on the novel. I'd be delighted. So Winter Counts is the story of Virgil Wounded Horse, who is a professional vigilante on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, which is where my people are from. And so the background to the novel, for those who haven't read it, is that many crimes go unpunished on native reservations because of a law passed by the US Congress over 140 years ago called the Major Crimes Act. So I don't wanna bore everyone with the details, but about 40% of violent felonies are not prosecuted rapes, child assaults, murders. Uh, the US government just refuses to prosecute them. And so what happens is you have professional vigilantes that for a price will go in and enact some justice, by which I mean a beating. Um, this is the story of one of those, Virgil Wounded Horse. Uh, just to set up the short piece that I'm gonna read, uh, Virgil has been asked to track down a heroin dealer who's bringing that terrible drug to the Rosebud Reservation. He initially declines, but then when his nephew, Nathan, unfortunately gets involved with the drug, he decides to take the job. And so he is traveling to Denver with his ex-girlfriend, Marie, where they are going to find the heroin dealers. So they're driving from uh, uh, Rosebud, South Dakota to Denver, Colorado, and they stop along the way in Alliance, Nebraska. This is based upon a real place at, that I will describe. So let me read for you several pages from Winter Counts. I watched the desolate Nebraska landscape pass by and soon I dozed while Marie drove. After a while, I woke up and looked around. Where are we? Just outside Alliance, still Nebraska. You need to stop? It had been a long time since I'd eaten or taken a bathroom break. Yeah, if there's a gas station, I could go for some beef jerky. She turned the music off abruptly. You ever seen this? I forgot about it till now. What? Look over there. The sign by the parking lot declared car henge and below that in smaller letters, entrance. We pulled into the empty parking lot. What's all this? I said, getting out of the car. Look behind you. I blinked a few times. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. About 20 old cars were buried in the ground Front, pump, front bumper down, standing straight up like monoliths. They were arranged in a large circle, and I realized that they were obviously some sort of bizarre homage to Stonehenge. Not only were the cars buried on their edges, the artist had placed some autos on top of the others as a kind of cap or connector, just like at the real Stonehenge monument. There were a few cars buried in the, on their sides in the center of the circle, serving as the focus of the installation. Crazy, huh? Marie said, looking up at the vehicles, which were all painted a uniform gray. Graffiti scarred some of the car's bodies. I saw Archie Sucks, I Love Mejita Bell, Daddy Long Legs, and in the corner, Wanagi Takaku. We walked around the circle. I'll say, who did this? I don't know, some guy with too much time on his hands. I read a little bit about him last time I was here. My first impulse was to mock the crazy man who created this weird folk art and make cynical comments about the ways of the Washichus. After all, what sort of cracked person spends their free time building giant sculptures at an abandoned farmstead in Nebraska? It must have taken years to create this odd melange of old autos in the middle of nowhere. 
We stood there for a while in the shadow of the statues and walked around the circle together. As we strolled between the buried vehicles, I began to appreciate the scale of what the artist had attempted. These were full-size American automobiles, buried, welded together, and painted gray, bottom to top. The artist clearly had a vision, a dream of what he wanted to express. A cynical statement about American consumerism? I didn't think so. For some reason, I had the feeling that the creator of this monument was guided by some deeper philosophy. There were no fees for admission, no chain link faces, fences keeping out gawkers. It seemed to me that the artist had been driven by a goal to convey some deeply held conviction expressed through the medium of 1970s automobiles. I wandered off to the edge of the circle by myself. It was quiet at the site, no one there except for Marie and me. I positioned myself at one end of the circle so that I could see the entire thing. In the silence, I began to appreciate the weird majesty of the buried cars. I thought about what it must have felt like 4,000 years ago to stand before the real monoliths in England and feel connected, truly connected to the earth, the stars and the spirits. I stared at the cars so long that my head began to spin and it seemed like I was drifting off into space, floating in the heavens. Time seemed to stop and the Lakota phrase, metakaye oyasin, we are all related, came to me. And in that moment, I understood what those words meant. I inhabited them as images, thoughts, and memories arose amidst the old vehicles. I saw my mother, gone but still with me, my father who died too soon, and my sister whom I'd love like my own life. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, they appeared before me, all of my relations, my ancestors, native and white, who loved and struggled, hunted and gathered, worked and played. They stood on this continent, looking up at these stars and these planets. It was daylight, but I could see the stars now, all of them surrounding me, lighting the air, their brilliance shining and radiating off the monoliths. And then it was dark, a black hole sky. But I looked down and saw that the stars, every one of them, were now in my hands, lighting up my veins, my muscles, my bones. I stood there alone with my ancestors and listened to them. Finally, I turned away. As I walked back to my life, the words my mother used to say finally came to me. Wakan Tanka Nichiun, may the creator guide you. Thank you so much. That was yeah. one of my favorite chapters in the book. Thank you. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you because it, Virgil kind of approaches that uh, setting with a little bit of skepticism, and then it kind of turns into this more kind of spiritual experience where he has he leaves with kind of a renewed sense of purpose. Um, and I wonder, like, what made you choose that setting for that moment? You know, so car hands is a real thing. I get asked this question all the time. It's a real thing in Alliance, Nebraska, out in the middle of nowhere. And when you when you when you go there and you visit, you you really do feel sort of strange. It it, it's, it's just a different sort of place. And so the few times that I've visited there, I have felt some, some strange feelings in my own head. So I thought this might be a nice place for Virgil to have the first reawakenings of his own spirituality. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, and such a beautifully, beautifully rendered uh, piece of the book. Um, well, I wonder if we could kind of talk a little bit about um, uh, the genre of the book. Um, it's described as a kind of literary thriller um, in the crime fiction category. Um, and I am, I love this genre, so I was very pleased to read this book. Um, but it, I was curious because it seems like in this genre, we have a sort of flawed protagonist um, with his own sense of justice in a system that kind of perpetuates injustice. And I kind of wonder if you could talk about sort of the marriage between the genre, kind of the elements of the genre, and then also where you chose to set your novel. Yeah, so the, the, the book is is being marketed as, as a literary crime novel, whatever that means. When I wrote it, I didn't specifically set out to write a crime novel. I just wrote the story as as I as I felt you know it it demanded to be told. Um, and I did have a couple of publishers wanting to purchase the book. One of them was going to market it as straight literary fiction. Uh, Echo is choosing to kind of focus more of their efforts on on crime. I'm fine either way. I just want 
the story to come out there. So it was set on the Rosebud Reservation because that's where my people are from. Uh, I live in Denver, Colorado, and I was raised here, but my mother was born on the reservation. And so I spent a lot of time there in my youth and I go back there quite a bit now. I take my two sons and we visit family there and, and uh, uh, partake in spiritual ceremonies. So it, it was important to me that I portray the reservation positively, but also honestly. And that was sort of a, a fine line to walk. Yeah, especially when you have such a relationship to it um, and you have community there and yeah, and they're gonna read this book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, uh, the, the kind of interesting thing about that too, I think between, you know, we're talking about, uh, being literary, but also being kind of in genre and being both of those things, you really kind of feel that in this, um, but it doesn't, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be pigeonholed or kind of put in a corner in any way. Um, and I also, that kind of brings me to another question I had, which is that, um, it feels like in this novel, you kind of, your characters are grappling with history in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that you do this amazingly well with um, balancing sort of this historical context with the present scene or the way that your characters kind of deal with uh, historical injustice in their daily lives. Um, and I wonder if kind of from a craft perspective, like how did you kind of approach striking that balance or was that a consideration that you had? Oh, thank you for that great question. You know, uh, uh, it was very much a consideration and I thought about it very consciously. I, I didn't want the book to read like a textbook, okay? I do teach Native American studies in my day job. And so I give these boring lectures and my students go to sleep, you know. I, I wanted the story always to come first here. I wanted it to be hopefully a, a compelling page turner. Um, now, having said that, I, I felt that it was important to bring in some of the legal and political events that a lot of folks wouldn't know about. And so, but I had to do it hopefully in an artful sense. So it didn't come, aco come across as like just a dry lecture. So I tried to, to weave it in, but, but just in little doses and enough to just orient the story and, and, and not, I guess, drag it down. That was my hope anyway, I hope I succeeded. <laughs> oh, abs I, absolutely. I was kind of in wonder because I think when you're writing anything to do with history, I feel like it gets so hard to, to balance those two things. But I think um, you put your characters in these situations, like I'm thinking about them at the hospital, um, when we kind of learn all about this sort of uh, government provided healthcare, which is completely substandard, um, that that doesn't feel like it's being injected in there. It just feels very natural to the characters and the setting and um, the plot. Yeah, I just want to jump in about that. So the healthcare, again, if, if folks haven't read the book yet, or maybe never will, um, natives, we get our healthcare from something called the IHS, the Indian Health Service. And that was part of the bargain that was struck between the US government and natives. It's like US government says, we're taking the continent, but we'll give you these little chunks of land called reservations. You'll get food forever and you'll get healthcare forever. That was the bargain. So it's not like a handout. Um, however, the healthcare that we get, as well as the food, is often substandard. The hospital on my reservation closed for a couple of years, and that's mentioned in the book. Uh, the, the healthcare was so bad, one woman um, was pregnant and they couldn't get her into a room. She actually wandered off to a dirty bathroom and gave birth in the bathroom at the hospital. Oh uh, this is, now, that didn't make it into the book, but you know, this is so. This is a real thing. They shut the hospital down. I, I, I believe it's, it's operating better now. So I wanted to bring some awareness to these issues that I think the US government needs to do a better job of keeping up their end of the bargain, which is providing, if not the finest healthcare, at least adequate healthcare. And the food we get is very substandard as well. I talk a lot about that in the book also. So again, I a lot of this, most of it is based on, on real life and real incidents from my own reservation. Yeah, and I think you know that all feels so uh, tied to the to the setting, um, and it's so natural the way that you again weave in this history and kind of weave in all these things without it ever feeling like there's too much, <laughs> um, and it really does inform the reading um, of what these characters are kind of dealing with and uh, engaging in, and um, it kind of leads me to my next question, which is um, I was reading a uh, quote by Claudia Rankine recently. Mm -hmm. And it kind of 
called to mind when I was reading Winter Counts. Um, and she said, um, for me, there is no push and pull. There's no private world that doesn't include the dynamics of my political and social world. When I'm working privately, my process includes a sense of what is happening in the world. Um, and it just seems like your novel too was so engaging with political, social dynamics. Um, and I wonder about that, how that affects your process. Um, is it separated? Is it completely integrated? Kind of how, how do you think about that? Yeah, really good question. So, so when I started this book, I, I I thought the book, the central theme of the book was going to be the broken criminal justice system on reservations, because I've been teaching about this for years. It's a it's an outrage. Um, we have both under prosecution of certain felonies, but then this didn't make it in the book. We also have over prosecution of other crimes. So this this again, this isn't in the manuscript itself. It may make it in the next book, but an offense that would get you six months in a, in a state court, like say somebody gets into a bar fight and so you get thrown into county jail for two or three months, that gets you five years in the federal system, five years. So we, we have both under and over prosecution of criminal justice offenses. Um, and so I thought that I was writing the book about that, but as I wrote the book, on the second or third draft, I realized, well, wait a minute, that is important here, and that's an important theme. But I realized that the book was mostly about identity. So each of the main characters in the book is struggling with their own identity. Virgil Wounded Horse is an Ayeska. So in our language, that is kind of a slur for half-breed because he's half-native and, and half-non-native. And so he, Ayeska means a, a translator, but it's now kind of a slur for half-breed. And, and so... He's struggling with his Lakota native heritage. His girlfriend, Marie, is struggling with her own identity. His nephew, Nathan, is struggling. So everybody's kind of struggling with their own identity. And I, and I realized that's what this book is about. So I started off writing about the political, but it became very much the personal. Yeah, and I think you can, you can tell that so, so well that these characters are grappling with that. But it's, it's kind of... Uh, it's hard to untangle from those kind of you know, the system that they're in. Um, that's really interesting. Um, and for, for you, when you're writing, do you feel your sort of lawyer self coming out or your political scientist, or is that, is this kind of a different identity for you as well as being a kind of a novelist? I, I have to kind of turn off the, the, the lawyer brain when I'm writing <laughs> because legal writing is really awful. Sorry to any lawyers that are listening out there, but if you are a lawyer and you're watching, you know what I'm talking about. Legal prose is very detailed. It's it's not very uh, good writing, to say the least. And I have to kind of turn that off and the tendency to want to over explain. I, I should say, I don't actually practice anymore. I am an attorney, but I haven't practiced in a while. I, I donate some of my legal expertise to native organizations around Denver but I'm not a practicing attorney now. So I turned that off and I have to sort of get into novelist head. So it, it is a different process altogether. I have to be in the right mood and that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think you know, the political science professor piece of it too is probably something you have to sort of disengage with a little bit. I, I do, I do. So that I do, I still do. Uh, I'm a, My day job is I'm a tenured professor of Native American studies. I. I don't teach English at my day job. I do teach creative writing at some MFA programs um, around the country. Um, but yeah, during my day job, my students don't know that I'm a writer and they, they really could care less, you know? So I just get in there and I just teach the classes. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not producing as much scholarship as I used to, but that also is a different type of writing. It's, it's very literal and you have to document every single thing and you have to be very careful. When I'm writing scholarship, scholarly pieces, I always have to think, have I included everything here? Is another scholar going to criticize my interpretation? So that is yet another mindset altogether. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot It's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, uh, or I was hoping to talk about uh, one of the joys for me of reading this book was um, the way that characters are introduced and then there's sort of different identities underneath and they all kind of change over the book. Um, and I kind of think of that sort of principle of Chekhov's gun, where if you introduce a gun in the first act, it needs to go off in the second act. 
And I felt that way about almost every character in this book that like that you presented them in one way and then they all sort of go off in a different way um, at just the right moments. Um, and just creating that kind of mystery and suspense, I think must be so challenging. Um, and I'm wondering, is, is that all in draft one or is, you know, is that a process? Oh boy, is it a process. <laughs> uh, this book went through 18 drafts, 18. And, and it, thank you for picking up on that. One of the joys was taking, you know, all of the characters and figuring out what their narrative and emotional arc would be. Mm -hmm. And so I really gave a lot of thought to this. The character Marie, especially, maybe the first two or three drafts, she was a really flat character. And I felt that I just had not given her enough attention into what she wants and her struggle and her conflict. So the later drafts, I really struggled to make her, as we say in creative writing, a round character, not such a flat character, you know? So, so not in draft one at all. This was absolutely a process. So I urge, you know, writers out there, emerging writers, it's, you know, the, the real work comes in the drafts when you, rework things and you have to step back and be ruthless. And then when I finished the book, um, I went to Echo and they they bought this book and the next book. Um, and my editor at the time uh, said, I need you to cut 10,000 words. Oh my. And so I thought <laughs> the book was done. I was happy with where it's at, but that was a lesson as well. And that is you can always go back and tighten things up. And so I went to a residency in, in outside of Chicago called Ragdale, and I hold myself up there for a month, and I I brutally cut scenes and dialogue. Uh, uh, it was it was rough, but I think the book was leaner, and so that was a lesson for me. When you think you're done, go back and see if you can make it even even tighter. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and it makes it makes the kind of important things really sing. I think if you can, because yeah. it does feel like there is no unnecessary stuff in this book um, all feels extremely uh, necessary and uh, just so interesting. Um, and I just love all of these reveals that <laughs> that happen over the course of the book. It's so surprising. Yeah. Um, and one of those kinds of turns, and um, this kind of comes towards the end of the book and without giving too much away, mm -hmm. uh, people who haven't read it, there's this moment when Virgil has this um, opportunity to kill off a character who has kind of wreaked havoc on his family and his reservation. Um, and he's reminded in that moment of a different sense of justice. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that moment um, and then these different senses of justice that kind of come, come in and out of the book. Yeah, that moment was a tough one for me to write because I wanted Virgil to kill off this character because the character is kind of, vaguely based on a kid that had bullied me in real life when I was mm -hmm. little. And so it's like, ha ha, finally, <laughs> ha ha. Um, and um, and I, I in, in an early version, I think I did have Virgil kill him, but I realized that Virgil is, has changed. And, and he is, as I like the way you said it, he's now answering to a different type of justice. And he's realizing that retribution and vengeance you know, aren't always the way to go, especially in the native value system. So I really struggled with that because part of me wanted Virgil to kill off this particular character, you know, uh, just for my own sort of childhood grievance, which I've been carrying for many decades. So, you know, um, <laughs> but but I, I, I realized that to stay true to the dramatic logic and, and the emotional arc of the book, that he had to back off. And so that one took a lot of thinking. Thank you for picking up on that. <laughs> well, it just seems like he, through the whole book, he's coming to terms with, again, you, like you say, identity. Um, but I also think like, what is justice? And what does that mean? Because he is this sort of uh, justice maker in some, in some sense to his own sort of moral compass. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that was sort of the larger arc that, that I, I had to kind of deal with here. So look, I personally don't approve of vigilante justice. I think that you should it, not take justice into your own hands or hire somebody to go out there and beat somebody up for you. I think you should let the authorities handle it. And and Virgil has a sense of this. He's, he's very uncomfortable with the morality of what he's doing, but it's not a black and white thing. If if somebody hurt my child, I have two boys and and there was no way and, and, the, and the feds, you know, the police were just walking away. I understand the impulse that you would want some extra judicial justice to be done. 
but it is obviously not the way we do things in a civilized society. And it's certainly not really in line with native values. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so Virgil does really obsess over the morality of what he's doing. And I think he does that right away too. Um, even when at the beginning, he sort of hired for this job to find Rick Crow, he like does his own investigation just to make sure it's like legitimate that he yeah. won't be doing this for no reason, that like he wants to be sure that he's bringing drugs in, um, right. that it, he doesn't feel like he's just kind of a hired hand. He like has this very like true sense of, um, you know, what he thinks justice is. Um, That's right. And I love that so Sybil sort of seems, his sister, um, sort of seems like his better angel who's always showing up at these moments when he needs clarity. Um, and she's ultimately the one who reminds him of sort of the justice of making amends instead of retribution is so well done. Oh, thank you. The, the, the sister uh, uh, scenes, you know, written in flashback were, were, not easy to write. Um, I'm an only child myself. I don't. I don't have any siblings, but I, I put myself in the mindset of what it must be like to to lose a sibling and how how that must must just haunt you. And mm -hmm. so so those those were were tough to write. But but I think they hopefully they added some important backstory to the tale. Yeah, there's something I actually wanted to ask you about because I'm just so curious from a sort of process point of view. Um, were there scenes? that were much, much harder to write that required much more revision and others that sort of came to the page fully realized? Um, and what kind of, which which scenes were the hardest to write? Oh boy, I, I've been asked this question a few times and I always answer it the same way. And that is the scenes involving Nathan, the 14 year old. Uh, so in the book for folks who haven't read it, uh, uh, Virgil is Sybil, his sister dies. And so he becomes the legal guardian for Nathan, uh, his, his nephew who's uh, 14 years old. So he becomes really a parent in, in a way. Um, and I am a parent. I have a 13 and a 15 year old, two boys. And, um, and, and in the book, Nathan nearly dies. Okay, that was an exceptionally hard scene to write. And what I did is I had to tap into some of the crisis, crises that have occurred in my own life. Mm. I've, I've told this story in other interviews and I have a, uh, a, a nonfiction piece about it that hasn't been published yet. But my youngest son, Sasha, a, a little less than two years ago, uh, I got a call. He was uh, the victim of a school shooting. Now he survived, he survived, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I was teaching at my, my university job and I get a call from my ex-wife screaming, there's a shooting at Sasha's school, 10 people are dead. Uh, I can't reach him on the cell phone. We, we couldn't reach our son, mm -hmm. I'm driving an hour away. Um, I don't know. I'm listening to the AM radio. They're like, yes, two gunmen, uh, 10, 12 dead. Um, we couldn't reach my son. Uh, it was horrifying. It was really every parent's worst nightmare. So that that sense of panic, I tap into that. If you read the book, there's a scene where there's not a school shooting, but another sense of panic. And I had mm -hmm. to emotionally relive those those moments. Now, let me tell you that my son made it. He is fine. Um, he had to hide in a closet when they got the word that there were two gunmen in the school. Uh, his teacher moved everybody into a dark closet and she gripped a uh, tennis racket. So if the gunman had come in, I guess she was gonna do this. <laughs> um, and um, thankfully there weren't 10 or 12 dead, but there was one. Um, one young man named Kendrick Castillo, uh, a gunman burst into his classroom, just two classrooms away from my son's class and and he said Every, everybody stay quiet and this young man latino and native man rushed the shooter took three shots in the chest died on the spot <sighs> but he he uh, was able to tackle the gunman and a second group of boys then disarmed him and so this you know it, it was a terrible thing that this young man died the the class gathered around him and stuck t-shirts into his chest to stop him from bleeding out because the school was on lockdown. Oh. It, was, it was a terrible thing. There's this sickness in our society of these school shootings, which, you know, we haven't had any in a while since we're all at home right now. But it, it you know, for a while, it seemed like we were having one every three months. And you, you think that it's never gonna happen to you. And I thought that as well. Uh, and then I got the call. Um, 
So anyway, so absolutely, the scene with Nathan, where he, where he nearly dies, was exceptionally difficult for me to write because I had to relive the moments when I didn't know if my own son was dead or alive. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so sorry you had to go through, I'm sorry anyone has to go through that, but that's powerful to tap into, uh, particularly that scene, because that was also very difficult to read, I think. I think there were several moments in this that were kind of uh, difficult emotionally to take in. I can't imagine kind of being on the other end of that. Um, wow, that's, I'm a little speechless. <laughs> well, thank you. And I, I don't mean to make people uncomfortable with it, but it was, you know, it's a thing that actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went to the young man's funeral and oh my goodness, um, his uh, engineering teacher, um, you know, they, they wheeled the casket up to the front of the stage and they had an honor cord for the, the young man that he, he was just three days from graduating high school. And he would have, he was the top student in engineering. So his engineering teacher says he was going to wear this on his cap, but he instead, the engineering teacher goes down to the casket and he drapes it over the casket, the honor cord, and he just breaks down. Mm -hmm. And at that point, everybody in the church, we are just wailing in pain yeah. because this young man had sacrificed himself so that our children could, could live. And so mm -hmm. it was a terrible thing in our community. It was the STEM school, Highlands Ranch shooting, if anybody wants to know what it is. It was um, awful, you know, the community were still kind of reeling from it. Anyway, um, thankfully my son was all right, but I, I honor that young man, Kendrick Castillo, for having the bravery that a lot of us would not have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, so that was kind of the, the hardest thing about writing this novel, uh, which makes ton, tons of sense. Um, was there any part of it that came kind of really easily or maybe that just kind of wrote itself in some sense? Yeah, there were there were three. Um, There's a character in there called Tommy, who's kind of the comic relief, which, you know, people that are reading it, you probably are like, gosh, this book sounds like a real downer. But but there are moments of humor in there, hopefully a lot, because mm -hmm. I wanted to vary the tone. It can't be all just grim and action and beating people up. There have to be funny moments. So I have a character in there called Tommy, and he's kind of a silly fella and just crazy and nutty. And, you know, every scene with him was just a joy to write. I just love to get into his head and 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 write him. So he is absolutely coming back in the next book. So uh, that's, that's for sure. He's uh, he, he was a hoot to write. And then there were a couple of scenes. I Although this is set on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, I had them travel to Denver, where I live now. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of scenes that I just had a lot of fun writing, they go to a coffee shop. We have a lot of these sort of pretentious coffee shops in Denver where people make a big deal out of coffee. I had fun writing that. And then they visit a cannabis store and that was that was fun as well. So absolutely, there are funny scenes in the book. It's not all grim folks, you know, there, there's some laughter in there, I promise you, okay? Yeah, there definitely is light, I think, to balance out the darkness. And there's, you know, the romance between Marie and yes. Virgil. Um, and sort of the family dynamic between Nathan and Virgil, I think, too. Um, yeah, there's definitely humor and warmth in addition to sort of some of the more gritty details. Uh, but I think it all works together. Um, something I was curious to ask you about is uh, the title, Winter Counts. Um, and it's a reference to uh, a pictorial calendar keeping, uh, traditional pictorial calendar keeping. and. Um, there's a flashback with Sybil and Virgil where they, I believe they lose their mother and they mark that year in their calendar and their winter count. Um, could you talk about that scene and, and how, why winter counts was the correct title for this book? I, thank you for asking that. Uh, winter counts is the traditional calendar system used by the Lakota people. So instead of using numerals, um, uh, 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 traditionally Lakota people would draw little pictographs, little drawings, maybe on a buffalo hide or or some you know something, some bark, and you know an event would be drawn to represent the most important thing that happened in the year. So, like if we were to do a winter count for 2020, it'd be the year of the pandemic and all of us crowded around our our computers on Zoom. Um, <laughs> so, winter counts was a traditional uh, pic, you know pic calendar system, the Lakota, which uses uh, pictographs, and. But obviously there's a double meaning because winter is a hard time for native people, especially up north in South Dakota. 
uh, it gets very cold there. You know, it gets 20 below zero sometimes. And and the scene that you're referring to, Virgil has a flashback where he remembers as a kid drawing little winter counts, you know, as a fun activity to do when he was a child. But they remembered that one year, the winter count event was the year, it was so cold that birds had frozen out of the sky, which actually happens. So it was a year that their mother died and the birds froze to death and fell to the ground. So again, that was one of the darker uh, scenes. So now my my publisher initially had suggested changing the name of the book. And I, um, I, I, I kind of dug in my heels on this a little bit because I did feel that Winter Counts was the appropriate uh, title in a lot of different ways. So they they were great to work with. So, you know, they, you know, I, I made my case and they, they accepted it, so. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's the right title too. <laughs> um, let me see here. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us kind of, you mentioned uh, the sort of, 2020 is the year of being on a computer screen as we are right now. Um, if you could talk what it's like, talk about what it's like to have this novel come out at this very weird time um, that you can't have the traditional sort of marketing tour that you you probably otherwise would have had. Yeah, it, it was a complete curveball that not just me, but but so many other authors. I had events booked all over the country. I had a book tour uh, uh, scheduled for this book, which came out in late August. Um, I had a book tour. I was supposed to go to the Book Expo Festival, which is where you you know get to meet booksellers and you know folks. And I was supposed to be the keynote speaker at a, at another uh, major book trade fair. And every single one of those things got canceled. And we didn't have a lot of time to decide what to do. So I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I was devastated because I was. I, I thought that I was going to get a chance to go meet readers and, you know, have have a, a reading and a book tour and and really sell the book. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, my gosh, the entire country is shutting down. Yeah. Um, what I did, what we did, I have a most wonderful team at Echo Books, including my wonderful publicist, uh, Sonia Chus. Um, we developed an alternate strategy. Um, I wrote some essays, one of which uh, appeared in the New York Times. Um, and so we we turned our attention to essays and obviously mm -hmm. virtual events. And thankfully, the book started getting a lot of attention. It was on, I don't know, 20 or 30 most anticipated book lists. And so we were able to get, you know, some attention focused back on the book. And I want to say, too, that, yes, I was devastated about a lot of things being canceled, but so many others had much worse outcomes. I mean, mm -hmm. people are out there still struggling to find work, struggling to put food on the table. So I just want to be very clear that I'm very grateful. It's a privilege to have a book come out, whatever the circumstances. And I still have a job, even though we took a pay cut, you know. So 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 many had it much worse. So I, I want to just make that quite clear. Yeah, yeah. I And I feel like, you know, if it, it does feel like, particularly for people who do have books coming out, it does feel like, you know, everyone's doing this at the same time. <laughs> um, that it felt like a scramble at the beginning, and now it kind of has started to feel a little normal. Um, amazingly, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess you know, one of the good things about virtual is that you can sort of do these these kinds of events and have it not be um, constrained by travel or all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, not the same as meeting your readers face to face and all of that stuff. I'd say if there's anything I missed, it was a traditional launch party because, mm -hmm. you know, launching your book, you know, I did have a launch event with the wonderful writer, Craig Johnson. So he very kindly agreed to speak with me. He he wrote the Longmire. He writes the mm -hmm. Longmire series of books and he was wonderful. And we had a, a great talk and all that. And, but, you know, there's like, usually like you want to celebrate, but then you turn the camera off and it's like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, now I'm alone. So I'll go watch some TV and do the dishes. Yeah. So, um, you know, but again, look, it's a privilege. The book has been so well received. It's getting a lot of acclaim and it's sold quite well. So I'm I, I'm very, very fortunate, you know. So it, it's been it's been all good. Yeah. Um I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh your pathway to publishing. Um I know you were working on this as a kind of a series of short stories toward the beginning when you were in your MFA program, but I wonder if you could just kind of chart the journey for us of of kind of inception to publication. 
Sure. So I, I, I wrote, I did write a short story also called Winter Counts uh, way back in my MFA program. I started off at a, a one MFA program and then um, I wrote a short story called Winter Counts there, but then a new MFA program opened up at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. It had just opened. I was either their first student or one of their first students. I transferred because this was a writing program designed for native students and staffed by native instructors. Mm-hmm. And so I thought there was no way that I couldn't attend this school. So I did lose a couple of semesters there mm-hmm. in, through the transfer process, but it was it was the right move. So I had written a story called Winter Counts where Virgil dies in the end, interestingly enough. So I killed Virgil off <laughs> at the end. And I, and, and I did publish that story in 2014 in the journal Yellow Medicine Review. Um, and I thought I was, I thought I was done. I thought I was done with uh, Virgil, but I, I just kept returning to him. And I, I just, I kept thinking, what would Virgil do? He kept popping into my head at weird times. And I said, you know, I, I want to come back to Virgil. And then about mm-hmm. 2017, I had taken a couple of years off from my MFA, but I returned and I said, I really need to see if I have the chops to write a novel. And I thought, well, let's go back and let's see if I can expand this story. And so I started writing it and writing it. I got about halfway done, and I'd been sending chapters to my MFA advisors at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And then I attend the 2018 AWP conference, <laughs> and I'm in the writer to agent program. And I, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even going to apply to that because I thought you needed a done manuscript mm-hmm. to approach agents. And I wasn't done I, by any stretch. I was about halfway done. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, okay. So literally the deadline is like two hours away. I put together like a little yeah. cover letter. I, I sent it off to AWP. To my surprise, three agents um, contacted me and said, I- I'd like to talk to you at the conference. And I'm, I'm wow, okay, yay. Uh, so I talked with uh, two of them and they were very excited. And they're like, when it's done, call me. Then I talked with the third one, who is my agent now, Michelle Brower. And I'm like, look, you know, I'm not done with this, but I, I, I think I can be done in six or eight months. So she's like, hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm going to go ahead and offer you representation. Wow. Now she had read 10 pages of the book. Um, oh, my God. Now, yeah. Now, folks, anybody listening, this is not common. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm told this is exceptionally rare. Okay. So uh, don't think that, you know, you're going to, you know, you can send 10 pages off and get an agent to represent you. But then I really felt a fire because I had somebody that really believed in me. And so I, uh, um, I, I got accepted to the McDowell colony. Now they just call it McDowell. And I had uh, five weeks there. And so I really went there and I just wrote morning till night. I was in Garland studio where James Baldwin had written one of his great novels. And I saw you sign your name at the McDowell colony. So you sign your name on these plaques. And so there is his name staring at me every morning. Also Michael Shabon's name. And, and so I felt really inspired. And so I wrote at least a third of the book while at McDowell. Um, so so it, it came quickly once I finally had some people behind me is the mm-hmm. journey. And what was um, working with Michelle like, um, or working with an agent? at all. <laughs> What's that process like? She's great. I mean, we, you know, uh, she's fantastic. She's uh, an amazing uh, agent. You know, she really got my writing style. You know, she's well connected, but more than that, she's just a, a great person. And so, you know, I, I, I feel we hit it off right away. I feel that I lucked out there and I, and I have AWP to thank for that. I, <laughs> I'm always very clear about this. Had I not attended AWP and, and, uh, submitted my sort of half-baked application to the writer and agent program, I would not have met my agent. I mean, who knows what would have happened. So I'm uh, very, very good. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to AWP. That's, I, I remember hearing about um, you getting signed at the conference because that, that was our first year doing writer to agent. Oh. Um, and so we weren't sure if it was going to work. We weren't sure, you know, uh, what the outcome was going to be. And so that was just like, oh, yes, like, it's working, it's connecting people to agents. Like it's, um, so that was like wonderful to hear that success story because that's exactly where we started it. So that's wonderful. awesome. I'm so happy that that happened at the at the Tampa conference, I think. That's right, that's right, it sure was, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of who your, who your own influences are, um, 
who would you say kind of influenced your work with this book specifically? Yeah, I've, I've written uh, a couple of articles on native crime fiction, and I've talked about my influences, and I'm happy to, you know, kind of go over those. But if anybody's interested, go to my website, davidwyden.com, and there I have links to these articles, and you can see uh, in more detail. Um, mm -hmm. I published an article in, I think, uh, uh, Crime Reads, um, and I talked about what I, who I think were the most important influences for me and who are some of the most important writers in indigenous crime fiction. Mm -hmm. There is a, he's not super well known, but Lewis Owens was a wonderful crime writer that wrote in the 80s and 90s, native uh, person. Uh, he's passed now. And I, I believe that he's the most important uh, native crime writer. And I, I just inhaled his stuff a decade ago. Um, there, Stephen Graham Jones, who a lot of people know now because he writes indigenous horror. He's he's mm -hmm. a friend of mine, um, and he's killing it with his book, The Only Good Indians, right now. But he also wrote a couple of crime books, including All the Beautiful Sinners. And mm -hmm. I've argued that Stephen Graham Jones is sort of the heir to Lewis Owens because he wrote this sort of surreal, wonderful crime novel. And so I was really influenced by those two. Now, in general, I'm deeply influenced by other crime writers, Jim Thompson, who writes noir, and in the Western genre, Larry McMurtry has long been my, my favorite author. I think Larry McMurtry, not just his masterpiece, Lonesome Dove, but a lot of his books, uh, All My Friends Are Going to Be Strangers, um, Last Picture Show, he tells a great story, he, he draws amazing characters, and he, he brings in important themes as well. So. I, you know, he's just amazing. And, and I, I need to cite him as important writing influence on my my style. Yeah. Um, and you talked about how earlier Virgil comes back to you or kept coming back to you. Um, and I guess that's continues to be true because this is the first in a series, if I have my facts straight. <laughs> um, can you talk about, you know, anything about your next your next book in the series? I'd be happy to. So um, I, I do have a contract for another book with Echo, so I'm currently sketching it out right now and, and writing parts of it, you know. Um, it is tentatively entitled Wounded Horse. That that title may change, okay? I'm not completely sold on that one. But um, all of the main characters from uh, Winter Counts will return, including one really exciting and cool new character whom I can't say anything about yet. So there is a yeah another book in the series that's coming, and I, I'll give a few teasers for those that have read it. Uh, the, uh, Winter counts. Marie is going to run for tribal council, so sort oh. of to atone for the sins of her father, mm -hmm. she's going to make a run at being elected to the tribal council uh, on the Rosebud Reservation. So I'm gonna I'm planning to have some fun with that. And uh, Nathan wants to become a, a professional vigilante like his uncle. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but 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 Virgil doesn't want that. So there's going to be a little drama there. So so the the arcs and the stories are 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 coming to me here slowly. Um, will it be a series? That I cannot say. It depends how people react to book two. But I can promise there will be at least one more book. Yeah, and what's, I mean, what's it like, is the process, are you approaching it differently for a sequel, or are you kind of going through the same motions you would normally go through for any new project? It's radically different, and I've been talking with some of my friends about this. Um, I just talked with David Troyer, who's a, a really important native, he's best known for his nonfiction, uh, his book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, was mm -hmm. uh, nominated for the National Book Award, but he has lots of great novels as well. And we, we talked about this, you know, writing the second book is, is a different thing because there are all these expectations upon you. Uh, I've been meaning to reach out to my friend, Tommy Orange, who I know mm -hmm. is, I think he's written his second book. And so uh, Tommy has been a great friend to me. And I want to ask him, it's like, because you talk about some pressure and expectations, you know, his book, his first <laughs> novel pretty much exploded over the galaxy. And uh, so I want to see, how he's doing. So it is completely different because book number one, nobody's expecting anything of you. You're not under a deadline. You can just let your creativity run free. Mm -hmm. book two, you've got deadlines. Uh, plus all these reviews that you've read are coming in your head. It's like, oh, wait a minute. They criticize me there. They criticize me for this. I probably should change that. So it is it is a, a different beast. Um, mm -hmm. I, I try to stay away from reviews because I'm trying to keep myself as untainted 
as I can, unsullied, you know. But again, I'm I'm thrilled that people have liked the book. It it was one of the best reviewed books of the fall. So, you know, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, I mean, for anyone who hasn't read it, I it's a, one of my highly most highly recommended books of 2020 as well, because um, it was just so fascinating, so well done. Um, I've never read a book like it. Oh. Um, and so I think it's, you know, so great. Um, and I guess, you know, to wrap up, I kind of wanted to ask, is there any question that you always wanted to be asked in one of these kinds of interviews? And for one reason or another, it never has been? Or is there something you want to talk about the book that that I missed? Well, you know, a question that frequently gets asked, but I love to be asked, is what are you reading now? I get asked mm. that a lot. And you know what? I love this question because I love to bring attention upon other folks that are doing great work. They're doing the mm. hard work of, of creating. And so what I'm reading right now is... Uh, Brandon Hobson's new book, The Removed, which is also coming out from Echo. So Brandon Hobson was nominated for the National Book Award for Fiction in, I think, 2019, I believe, um, for his book, Where the Dead Sit Talking. And he and I are good friends. Uh, he's a native writer from Oklahoma and now in New Mexico. And I have an advanced copy of his new book. It's coming out in February of 2021. And it's superb. I'm reading it. It's, it's just great. Um, my good friend, uh, Sean Cosby, who publishes under... Uh, the name S.A. Cosby has a book, Blacktop Wasteland. It's a wonderful crime novel. Um, you know, he's gotten all the attention in the world and deservedly so. Uh, my friend Kelly Jo Ford, if anybody doesn't know, Kelly Jo Ford is another native writer. She has a book, Crooked Hallelujah, that is just great. It's it's a novel in stories. So I, I just love, oh, and there's another great book coming out, The Effort by uh, Claire Holroyd. Now, this is not a, a crime book. Um, it is, I, I guess you'd call it a, apocalyptic fiction, and it's coming out in January called The Effort, The Effort by Claire Holroyd. And I also had the good fortune of being able to, to read it. And so it's just a pleasure. When you have a book out, people start sending you these early copies before things are released. I'm like, oh, yay. And, <laughs> and so I, I love being asked this question because, you know, it's just great to be able to spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. And now I have a new to be read list, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for today. Um, we're just so thrilled that you could be our November book club pick um, and that we could really spotlight your book because um, it's wonderful. And I highly recommend all of our EWP audience to go out and read it. Well, it's my pleasure and my honor. And thank you. And, and again, for folks that are watching this, AWP is a great organization take advantage of the programs because they're there. I'm, I'm here to tell you that the programs work. I was also a mentor um, last fall in the mentor program. So I mentored an emerging indigenous writer. So you have all of these wonderful programs at AWP. And, and so, you know, please folks, you know, do yourselves a favor and take advantage of them. So thank you and thank you, AWP.